tēnā rā tātou, ko toro wā ka tōku ingo, no kōna e au, no te rohe e whānui o Ngāti Kāngini, ko tōku iwi whāiti, ko Ngāti Pāhauera, engari ka heki iho au mai ngā hapu o tēnā rohe o Ahuriri, ko Ngāi Tāwho teitahi o tāku tēnō tīpuna o konei, Heko iho ki taku tīpuna ko Rōpune, heko iho ki au. My husband and I came here in 2002 and we initially opened it up as a backpackers and we had 50 people and we made the heaps and heaps of friends with the backpackers and ended up going to weddings and the births of babies all over the world in 2007. We kept it open as a backpackers for another year, year and a half, but um, because of ill health we changed it into a tourist facility because you couldn't actually mix both things. Obviously when backpackers are here, what they want is um, they want to feel at home, they want to be able to come out, make a, a barbecue, have a party, play guitar, um, whatever they want to do. And um, having tours at the same time was too invasive, so we had to make that strange decision of um, cutting out one of them. And we got the tour developed and we translated it into 16 languages and then we added a ghost tour, then we added a kids tour. We tried to sort of cover all the full spectrum of visitor experiences. A native person is the oldest person in New Zealand and it's the only person which has heritage status. It was built in 1850s and shut down in 1993, December 6th at 3 o'clock. So it has a lot of history here. Even prior to it being a person, the land has it's a place of significant importance to the Maori community. This area was a part of a Maori settlement called Hukariri. And as part of that settlement, there, were, there was an um, area set aside for the observation of stars. Um, I think the main star they observed was Antares. Different areas in New Zealand, they focus on different stars for harvesting and for all those things they would come here look at the stars even up today when you look at the sky in the night from the Napier prison you can get a very clear overview of the sky the significance important that this place is we have a hanging yard of our own symmetry a lot of laws women children they talk about all those things how it was used as a quarantine center back in the day even before COVID and all these places was used back in the 18. Uh, 70 as a quarantine centre as well. Ko Ali Bill O, ko o Tatara te maunga, ko tutakuri te awa, ko Ngāti Kahununu uh, te iwi. We had that really strange, wonderful Neglected and Criminal Children's Act where, where people who couldn't provide for their children and if they got caught doing breaking law would get taken by the local provincial government and held in our prison until they could be sent off to a workhouse and there were several workhouses across New Zealand. One's now Waikiria Wai Prison, so it grew. Um, and so you'd, like the 30s, there would have been displaced people because of the depression, because of our earthquake. Mums trying to look after their kids are most likely in there. Yeah. So other people that have come through, customers, uh, investigators, have said they've heard children laugh. The other thing that I think is quite tragic with the prison is the fact that a lot of the inmates here were um, were here solely because they were dyslexic. And because of that, they couldn't read and write to, enough to get their theory for driving. So they took it upon themselves to just get in the car and drive and go to work to provide for their family and, and whatever it is. And it's, it's a sad indictment in, in education these days that, that that had to happen. The prisoners used to work at the quarry initially, and the wall was built in uh, 1906. That's why on, on the top of the gate it says 1906. A royal family visit was supposed to happen in that year, so the prisoners who were working at the quarry, they moved the rocks from the quarry all the way to the prison. Laterally, it was manned by Jack the Bastard Adams and his team. 
But prior to that, the inmates here that were on work parole would have to go down there and actual quarry um, the rocks. And a lot of these rocks were placed in the walls, as you can see round about. In return, they were allowed to engrave whatever they want on the rocks as well. So if you come out and see, you will see a lot of designs the prisoners have drawn. When the earthquake happened, because all the floors in the corridors were made of dirt, there was no vinyl, there was no wood on top until latterly. Um, so the whole building made up of variegated sort of wooden, like, tiling almost the way the pattern was. That all moved pretty much with the earthquake. The corridor does undulate in down towards the women's wing down that block there, but we had to reinforce all the beams and all the structure and we had to insulate as well. There was lots of things that happened in the, in the prison here, like the top dog had a key pressed into the old life boy soap. The guys in here called it Liberty Soap. And on loads of occasions in the pound area, there was two individual cells. Generally opposing gang members were in there. They'd go out for that one hour a day and their prospects or friends would be lurking in the bushes and they would feed them down KFC and all that in the solitary confinement area. They'd have um, tennis balls that had been slightly slit open and they were filled with dry goods. Um, it could be money or drugs or whatever. There was people who used to go out and perform robberies and all sorts by using that same key, which was hidden out the back there, just on the opposite, of, opposite side of where the cages are. They never used to have toilets in the cell. Then plumbers came and put a new toilet. But prisoners found out that this whole place is wooden, not a concrete wall. They can move things around and make a hole on the wall and come out. Because of it just comes out to the garden, they can climb through the fence and go to KFC, movies, and come back. But some person told me who used to be here, there's some rules for them. They can go out, they can't drink outside. They can bring it in, but they can't drink because their rule was if you start drinking, then you get in trouble, then the whole plan gets ruined. That's what they reckon, but I don't know how <laughs> honest they are, everyone, each other, but they definitely went to movies, pub. One guard had said goodnight to everybody, well, you know, locked them up, like banged the door, ticked off the rotor, you know, everyone was in bed and then he went to a Christmas Eve party and he was in the corner um, sipping on a beer and he looked over in the opposite corner was one of the inmates <laughs> dancing up a storm. So of course that um, all hell broke loose and he, he was escorted back to the prison. One guy was given the, the task of to go out into the community and do some, some sort of nefarious act and he decided to take himself off to what was then the provincial hotel. He went in there and um, he got acquainted with a lady who proceeded to sit on his knee and they were canoodling and all sorts of things. Unbeknownst to him, his wife had been informed by a friend that her husband, who should have been tucked up in jail, was sitting in the, in the pub with somebody else on his knee. And of course, she went and spotted the situation, reversed out and dialed the police who came and arrested his ass. So, so that, that, that was enough, another um, story that, um, yeah, there's so many. <laughs> the people that have been in that prison did horrific things, but somewhere in there, someone needs to have been good. How can you expect it if you don't show it? Yeah. How can you understand this story if you don't try and understand both sides of it? There was one guy who was only 16 who um, there was no place for him in, in a junior facility so he was brought in here and he was a huffer so he used to um, sniff solvents, glue and all that sort of thing. 
he was put in cell number two and after a few days he just decided to check out and he proceeded to take some rough bits of his sheeting and tie it and hang himself in that cell and he's written a little epitaph it's in red and it says Wayne in hell and then it's got F-E space Q-U-E. Kitty Opa's story is really, really, really heartbreaking. It's a real, it really for me identifies the unfortunate things we went through in our history of colonialism and, uh, and the weird journey it's taken us to get to now. So this man had uh, land, well there was land in Oportiki and it was a safe zone. So there's a marae on it where people could go if they were really old or unwell. It was safe. There was no fortifications around the marae, families, children. And Kiriopa had made really good connection with the, the locals there and he worked as like a soldier or policeman in and out of the area assisting. Everything seemed quite good. Uh, another gentleman called Faulkner, um, who was a German missionary, had realised land value at that time was really important and he came up with this plan he figured it all out and handed it across to the local army general that basically mapped out how they could go in and take the land by force so they did they went in very late at night and hid in the in the forest area and at dawn they all went in and slaughtered everybody and in that slaughter were Kiriopa's wife and children and family members and old people and he came back into the area from work to find out this had happened and was, as you can imagine, completely horrified and upset and had found out that Faulkner was responsible and hunted him down. And I'm really not 100%, I was hearing this story recently from a friend of mine that it involved Faulkner being taken and hanged and his eyeballs being pulled out, his head being held up in the in the church where he had preached. And it was, you know, what well, in Māori Dima call Utu, it's, um, it's a justice, it's full-on revenge, it's extreme, but you could not be, you couldn't not be that upset and extreme if your children and wife had been taken. And eventually... Kiriopa is found hiding in the Uruweta Ranges with a group called the Hoho or the Paimairea and they were all wanted men as well by the government and he's brought and trialled and hanged in our prison but he's got to walk through people and then get up the gallows which would be a travelling set so it's not there all the time it's got two drop floors so just in case it doesn't work the first time, we'll pop you down the second time. And everybody's watching, and they've paid to be there. And then, like, for Rollins, it's being advertised in the local rag for days, if not longer. So we run out of tickets, because we sold so many tickets, that people are climbing all of the trees to see over. That must have been frightening and horrific. Anyway, uh, this amazing thing happens in New Zealand because of Treaty of Waitangi where we have to make amends and or Portiki region get to start reclaiming their land and, and telling the stories that happened and has, this land is sorted. The government realised they really probably should should apologise for the death of this man so they write a really lovely letter, lovely, lovely letter and pardon him. So they hanged him in about 1872 and then pardoned him in like 2000 and. 14. Just sorry about it. Yeah, bit of a mistake. So poor Roland's really, really ill. There is a, a few cases documented of him having some issues and having to spend time in the police station and his wife would care for him at the, in the jail cells there uh, in Ormondville. And the first time I heard his story, I was told that he could hear the villagers coming with burning torches to burn down the house while the family were asleep and so he would save them by taking their lives. Uh, the information I've read is that he, he did think there was some danger coming and so once they had all gone to rest he 
took a log of wood from the firebox and stunned each of them on the head so they were knocked out and then one at a time took a butter knife that he'd sharpened and cut their throat and then resharpened the knife and cut the next one's throat and he went through this with his wife and um, and some several of his children like most of his children and then thought he should take his own life which was very unsuccessful and then he ran looking for help to several neighbours and eventually he was found under a bridge and really wound up and very upset. So he was quite mentally unwell. Definitely documentation that, that proves that he wasn't well and you, you wouldn't have got the support then that you would get now. We've got so much information on every inmate that was in here up until the um, like mid 1950s. After that, there's um, you know like the the process of where privacy and all that sort of thing, and you need to wait for a long while. Which does not mean that inmates don't come up on a weekly basis and tell us exactly which cell they were in, what they did, where they used to hide the drugs, all of that. So you can see everything had to be bolted and concreted because the inmates, if they got bad news from their visitors, of course they would pick up the nearest object and, and hoy it or throw it at whoever was in their pathway because oft times you would have perhaps an inmate who had been in here for maybe seven, nine months and then his wife would turn up visibly pregnant and that would cause real friction and perhaps his brother was standing sheepishly in the background you know like saying nah, well you know so all of those types of things um, happened here. It, it might have been in there uh, he had been in on most likely fraud charges the man himself had had some physical disfigurement from burning and his moustache was ginger and then black where the, where the burn marks were and I don't know if it was his age or they just felt sorry for him but he was allowed to bring one of his many many cats in with him and had stayed with him till he I guess passed of so we say natural causes in prison and so this cat turns up so many years later 2002 and this cat has a ginger and black moustache as well. She goes to the cell to sleep or, or sit at, well that's Basil's cell, and so she became called Basil uh, when the backpackers were there, she was very well fed and cared for, and when our staff were working there we just, yeah, you'd talk to Basil every day, she was a fan of sausage rolls, um, just a little bit. Well I gave her the name Marjorie, I just thought that that suited her because she was very regal. <laughs> but. Um, after, after a while, we used to get inmates coming up here and, and saying, is that damn cat still here? And, and I was like, okay, when were you in? And they would say, you know, like late 60s, early 70s, 80s, you know, like lots of people. And then the story about Basil, the actual human being who had been in here, who had been injured in a house fire and had a, half a black moustache. And everyone saw, dee doo, dee doo, looking at her cat who was then called Basil, um, and the exact same half a black moustache. And often with, with Air Basil, you could be working away in the corridors and making beds or cleaning or doing whatever um, when it was the backpackers, and then you'd hear clump, clump, clump of real heavy footing, and you'd turn around and it was Basil. When Marion came here, opened the place in, the cat was inside the prison, so no one knows with the cat come or anything. That's why we call ghost cat. Um, but she used to feed the cat, but it doesn't mean the cat was friendly with her. Never. She feeds, run away. She can't even a pet or nothing. But it's funny, when I come back from work or something, the cat's there, straight away, leave the place. That cat follow my wife all the time. It's just she felt it's just protecting her from something, not letting her escape. She said to me, she's really <laughs> scared. Even sometimes enter into my our own home in dark times, she's a bit think, oh, you go first. But here, when she was with the cat, she said to me, she felt 
No, she's not scared. She feels like protected. Like look, look, like feeling like look at someone looking after her. The Basil, the cat's died now. This is really sad. Our whole team was really sad to hear that she had passed. She's a very, very old cat. So, but the thing is, interesting thing is, people can still see Basil roaming around. A few months back, I had a grandmother and the grandchild who came for a tour. Uh, they were like, "Oh, we saw Basil, and he played around with Basil." I was like, "Basil is not here anymore." Basil passed away some time back. They were like, "No, you're kidding me." I was like, "No." Then I was like, "I showed a picture of the cat." They were like, "This is the exact cat we saw, and we played around with it." So I was like, "I'm sorry, but Basil is not there anymore." It's not the first time, but I get multiple people telling they can see Basil and that they can uh, they played around and all. On our records, Basil lived for 27 years. He had the prison, but uh, normally a cat like that lives for a maximum of eight years. Some of the visitors still come up here and expect Disneyland, and of course, that's not what we offer. We make no apologies about um, what we offer. It is grim, it is dark tourism, and we are really happy that we are the caretakers of this facility. I think everyone needs to see what it's like behind the doors of the oldest prison in New Zealand, because it's such an iconic area. That you can walk and you can actually see what the 1931 earthquake did for a start. You can also see what it was like in behind the walls and how cold you would be. You can see what the inmates ate, what they wore. One guy is Freddie Ewer, and then there's another one, uh, Gary Gerbys. Now Gary, um, I mean, I haven't seen or neither of them any teeth. But I haven't seen them for years and years. But I remember when we first opened here, Gary saying um, that this was the best years of his life. And he was showing his um, grandchildren 